And I'm an anthropologist, and anthropologists um, uh, live and die with the stories that they can tell that to try to illuminate uh, either great theory or specific problems that, that might be um, interesting. This is a community called Caraballo. Caraballo is on the northern cone of Lima. And from most people's perspectives in the United States, you'd see this and you'd say, wow, it's just a terrible, poor area. But there's some clues that give it away in terms of, um, in, in the sense that this is the wealthiest area that we work in. If you look at, if you look at the, uh, the picture carefully, you'll see that there are lights and electricity. Half the homes have uh, running water and electricity inside them, which is something that we can't say for almost any other area that we work. We work in um, rural Malawi, we work in rural Lesotho, we work in rural Rwanda, uh, we work in Chiapas and some of the poorest uh, communities, and we work in rural Haiti, of course, where there's still no electricity. Uh, the, the Siberia, um, you know, Siberia is sort of um, one of the more, more developed areas, again, that we work. But Siberia, uh, an average physician, makes about $30 a month um, uh, in terms of income. So this is Caraballo. Uh, we came to Caraballo to do a pretty straightforward project, and we found patients like this. So this is an elderly woman who has been treated for tuberculosis. At, when, when this picture was taken, she'd been treated four times in what was one of the best tuberculosis treatment programs in all the world for a poor country. Peru had a fantastic tuberculosis treatment program, and they, they cured about 85 to 90 percent of their patients. But for some patients, they weren't getting the cures. And the reason was, we, we thought, fairly straightforward. MDRTB, multi-drug resistant TB. Now, my guess is that folks from Athens, Georgia, near Atlanta, know what MDRTB is. You remember the guy who got on the plane, and you know. So um, we heard that he might have been infected in either Peru or Vietnam, right? So there's not a lot of MDR-TB here. If you're living in Atlanta, Georgia, you're not going to walk into uh, a movie theater and get infected with MDR-TB. You have to go to places like this. MDR-TB, by definition, is tuberculosis that is resistant to the two most powerful drugs, isoniazid and rifampicin. Rifampicin is the most powerful drug. And it's the last drug that was ever uh, discovered and, and uh, brought to market strictly for the purposes of treating tuberculosis. And that was over 35 years ago. So we've had no new drugs for tuberculosis for almost 35 years. Now, this woman kept getting treated over and over and over again, and we knew that she had drug-resistant TB. Now, how, how could we find out? Well, um, when we started asking questions, the local authorities got very angry. So we knew that what we'd have to do is take her sputum and take it to Massachusetts because there's no place in Peru that could actually do the studies that would prove that she had drug-resistant tuberculosis. So, you know, we, we fly back and forth. I used to fly back and forth um, at least uh, twice a month or so when I was in, uh, um, uh, when, when, uh, when we were just starting this project. And um, we always flew through Miami. And if you look, if you go to Miami airport, there's all these signs up that says, you, know, you can't bring birds or animals or food, but there's nothing that says you can't bring sputum. So, uh, so we brought the sputum in a hand-carried luggage. So, you know, we'd, we'd have these, uh, we'd have her in, in, in particular, uh, drink a lot of water the night before to get hydrated, and then four o'clock in the morning, we'd go tap on her back, she'd give us a sputum sample, we'd put it in, a, in one of those little sort of, uh, you know, little lunchbox things and carry it through Miami airport. Um, you know, the amazing thing is we never got caught doing that, but, of course, it was clear what she had was drug-resistant tuberculosis. And sometimes these, these people were resistant to five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten drugs sometimes. Um, uh, we have documented cases back in the early 1990s of what they're now calling XDR-TB, extensively drug-resistant TB, which is drug res resistance to the first two drugs plus two more classes of drugs. So when we saw this, we said, well, what are you going to do? This, this particular community of Caraballo that I showed you a picture of out of 100,000 people who were living in that community, there were, we had documented 50 cases of MDR-TB. So 50 out of 100,000 MDR counts as an outbreak. Uh, all cases of TB in the United States and, and, and in, in the last couple of years was around six or seven cases per 100,000. So if you have 50 cases of MDR-TB, it's a real problem. So what do you do? Well, we said we have to treat these folks, right? Well, the World Health Organization said no. In developing countries, people with multidrug resistant tuberculosis die because effective treatment is impossible. So the first thing they said was, it's impossible. 
You can't even do it if you wanted to. Even if you had the money, it's impossible to do. They also said it's too expensive, and it detracts attention and resources away from treating regular TB. Now, right at this point in 1996, the cost of treating a person with drug-resistant TB just for the drugs was over $25,000. Okay. So it made sense. Back in those days, the Peruvians could treat a case of regular TB for around $150. Why would you treat people for $25,000 when you could treat the sort of garden variety TB for $150? At this point, it was around 1996, um, the World Health Organization was saying, don't treat it, you know, it's not an issue, just ignore it. Um, um, some people were even saying, it'll just go away. The authorities in Peru were more uh, adamant. They said, if you treat a single case of drug-resistant tuberculosis, we will kick you out of the country. So they were going to kick us out of the country for trying to save someone's life. Right? Happens all the time, actually, you'd be surprised. So what do we do? Of course, we started treating people. And um, at first, what we did was we borrowed drugs from the local hospital, Brigham and Women's Hospital. And um, you know, it was great, because we were working in Caraballo with a, um, a, a local priest who um, was, uh, was formerly uh, from Boston. And so it turned out that some of his former parish parishioners were working in the pharmacy. So we started an account. And th this is Paul Farmer and I, when we were still uh, in training at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And we just started an account. We started carrying drugs out. And you know, we, there was no basis for us to start an account. We didn't have any money. And we ran up a bill of $96,000. And the president of the, of the uh, hospital then called some of our uh, teachers and said, what the hell is going on? These guys have a bill of $96,000. We were hoping he'd pay it, um, the, the president. <laughs> he never did. But let me tell you, the Brigham and Women's Hospital has uh, given us um, something like 10 or $15 million now to do this work. It's just extraordinary that one of the, one of the most, one of the fanciest, one of the most well-respected hospitals in the world has put so much time and energy into helping us uh, treat patients like this. So um, we treated them. We got about an 85% cure rate. We were, we were paying $25,000 per person. And we had a meeting in Boston. We invited all the leaders in the global TV community, and we showed them our results. 85% cure rate in our first group of 45 patients. They were stunned. They, had, they, they really didn't think it was possible. They didn't think there was any way to use these old, toxic, weak drugs and cure people. And this is just how we did it. We trained community health workers to go to these people's homes and actually give them injections. In this case, she's giving an injection of something called capriomycin, a very old drug made by Lillian Company um, that um, uh, is not used anymore because it's weaker and uh, has more side effects than the currently uh, available drugs. And you have to give it by injection. So at that meeting, April of 1998, the World Health Organization said, OK, it's not, it's, no, we can't say anymore that it's impossible to treat. Uh, what we'll do then is to try to figure out how to organize ourselves so that we can come up with some good protocols for how to treat it. But they said, you know, um, it's all fine and well that you've learned how to treat it, and you've shown us that you can treat it, but the price is too high. $25,000 is no way. So I asked them, I mean, my, my PhD, uh, I wrote on the international pharmaceutical industry, so I investigated these drugs that were $25,000, and it turns out that they were all old, generic drugs. And the only reason they were expensive was because they were only used in, 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 in wealthy countries. So um, Eli Lilly, for example, was making the drugs, and a vial, a single vial of capriomycin, one day's treatment of capriomycin, cost $30 when we started. And it cost $30 because Eli Lilly was only making it because they were the last manufacturers in the world. They were the only ones making it, so they felt like they had to do it in a quality assured way. They weren't making any money off it. So we put a committee together, and we um, tried to get as many people who were interested in treating drug-resistant TB together as possible. Medicine Sans Frontier, Medicine, the, the Doctors Without Borders group, put up a million bucks. And within a year, we brought the price of the drugs down between 85 and 98%. Now, when I first asked the guys at WHO, do you, do you, know, you know these drugs are generic? They said, what do you mean? So here was a group of people in Geneva having declared a death sentence on any poor person in the world with drug-resistant TB, and they didn't know that these were generic drugs and that the prices could be brought down. Now, you know, I wish I could tell you that that's a rare event, that people in powerful places like the World Health Organization never make mistakes like that. 
that uh, the interests of poor people 